We are going to offer a collect together, a different collect, and then dive in. Although, what I will do after the collect, before we launch into the material, and this is the reason I have this, is I'm, and this you need to know, I'm doing this precisely because I want to find out what God is doing. See, I don't always know. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask you a question. Well, okay, you've now been through two out of the four sessions. What has struck you? What has been personally important? The Holding my hands like this. And what I want to do is actually make that list up here because what that actually is going to do is help shape how I get at the material in session three, which is actually doing this, learning how to be the channel as opposed to merely the recipient. And why that is as that is co-equally important. It's not the afterthought. Um, it's actually a part of the healing in the process. So Anyhow, then. be prepared, because I'll say, okay, we prayed, have a seat, thank you. What struck you? We'll start putting the list together. So, so in the light of the song, let's do the list first. What are you hearing? What is struck you? Let's do a little bit. How we see God and come to Him. How we see God and come to Him. I've just learned that I have these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The shape and combination are synonymous. God's always beckoning us on to the next step in his plan for us. That's the truth. Just 
One brief story. Very, a very good friend of mine. His mother was, has always been a pretty faithful Christian, and he, by his own testimony, grew up in a Christian household. His dad died. His mother is now in her 80s, and she is now in a retirement community. She had to because she, it's more like assisted living. She can't really function entirely on her own. And she thought it was a prison. Hated being there. And finally, it was like, okay, she asked the right question. What am I doing here? Two different stories, actually. Two different women. The first woman started leading a Bible study for women that became so popular that not just residences, but women from the community, and they heard about this through their church, started going to this Bible study, including the, my friend's son's future wife. And the grandmother introduced them through that Bible study. <laughs> Second woman was a woman I knew that was a part of the church where I served. And in her, she was like 91 or 92, she fell and broke her hip off when she fell off her exercise bike. <laughs> And she was mad as a woman. And I actually didn't know her. Um, I mean, there was a group that visited her. She lived way out, used to live close to the church. And I was relatively new to the church, so I'd not met her yet. Hadn't made my way around that way yet. And so my first introduction to this woman was in this nursing home, not terribly far. It was a real, for real nursing home. And unfortunately, not a very nice one. And, um, and she had to sit, but I walked in, and there she was, propped up in her bed. And there was this very old, tiny Bible and prayer book right by our bed. And um, why am I in here? Just like that. And so we chatted for a little while. Her name was Beth. And I said, well, Beth, you've been here long enough to know that a lot of these people do not get visitors. They are forgotten. And yet you have all of your faculties around you, and you're learning how to get around in a wheelchair. Maybe that's your new calling. Maybe you need to start going to see these people. First, she wasn't particularly happy with the idea. <laughs> but she started doing it. End result was, I couldn't find her when I would go see her. <laughs> Sometimes the nursing staff didn't even know where she was. Down two floors and off in a room seeing someone. And I mean, she did that, and she passed away at 107. <laughs> she left an extraordinary legacy in that very, not very nice nursing home. It was really quite astonishing. So no matter what, see, there's no room in this scenario for, well, I'm retired, so it's time to let other people do this. You may not do the same things, but there, I really believe it is not an option to do nothing. To, even if you are a part of the retirement crowd that occupies itself with bridge and golf and things like that most of the time, unless you're a part of that foursome or sitting at the bridge table, being available to be God's minister, I'm not sure you're living a godly life. Really not. What else? Anything else on the list? Can you pray that God will succeed you on the service of your life? Or below the service of your life. And you're right, because that really does take revelation. God has to be the one. Remember, this John 14, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. And if you take that and collect it with, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then a part of what truth shows you is both who God is and who you are. Anything else? I would say better yet, pray that I have the courage to see below the surface of my life. To 
be a Christian requires courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if the best you can do, which is true for most of us, is to quote the psalm, you are my hiding place. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being afraid but doing the right thing anyway. It's, it's not necessarily an emotional change. Okay. With that in mind, I want you to take your prayer book and stand up. And we're actually going to pray two columns. One expresses the big picture, and the second expresses my role in the big picture. Okay? So the first one is on page 254, Collect 9 of the Reign of Christ. Two fifty four collect nine. So let us pray this together. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well beloved Son, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be free and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Just, we're going to come back to this, so if you need to want to put your finger in or stick a piece of paper in it, that's fine. Then turn over 101. This is the third colleague for missions in morning prayer right two. This is not a Cranmer prayer. This is actually by Jeremy Brent, the first missionary bishop to the Philippines. Let's offer his prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the heart of the cross, that everyone might come within reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands to love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Now, the first is the Colic, 254, of the reign of Christ. This takes us back to Cranmer. In essence, it encapsulates the entire, um, actually the entire book of Revelation. It's right here. In other words, where is history headed? We are people, and you need to know that this is unique. Um, this is something that the West and Western um, civilization has adopted as a way of viewing history as progressive and linear. There are plenty of cultures that do not view history as progressive and linear. They see it as cyclical, circular. It's a different way of thinking about life. We've adopted some of it. What goes around comes around. But the Bible is presents a kind of historic trajectory. God's acts in history. It's always grounded within genuine, real, and true human events. It's a part of what spares us from thinking about the Bible in mythological terms. In other words, not historically true, but teaches us things that are important. There are portions of the scripture that may be like that, but the flow of the scriptures from the beginnings of Genesis all the way to Revelation is we're being taken through the flow of God's expression of himself, his will, and his outworkings in the context of history and human experience. So, what is God doing in the world? The answer is, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, is that happening? Is that has that happened like already? The answer is no. Which is why we get the second part of the prayer. Mercifully grant, see, again, it's all based on God's mercy, not what we deserve. Mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved 
by sin. And notice the description of the outworkings of sin. They're social. They're structural. We're talking about the ordering and the outworking of society. So we're talking about things like divisions of race and class, of the betters and the lessers. And it is, in fact, an enslaving system. I mean, slavery is a wicked evil, but the bottom line is, is that slavery is a symptom. It has to do with how we view humanity. If we view humanity in a particular way, that the lesser appropriately serves the greater, that becomes our anthropological justification for slavery in whatever form it takes, whether we're talking about chattel, whether we're talking about prostitution and human trafficking. I mean, we're and I mean, we're talking current problems here. I'm not talking about something that happened 150 years ago. Um, it has to do with how we view and can, as a result of the way we view, use other people. One of the ways that really breaks the cycle of people who are caught up, for example, in pornography is that they begin to realize that these images are human beings. And oh my God, what is happening to them? Um, the average, I read not too long ago, that the average life of a porn star, with a few exceptions, is somewhere between five months and three years. And after that, they're worn out. I mean, so it's, it, it's, it's never my private addiction ever, you see, ever. There's always a larger and costly social implication. And so what we're talking about here is we're talking about social structures as well as the condition, the individualistic condition of the human heart. Mercifully granted the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together. So that the end result is not just freedom where I can do whatever I want. I am the autonomous individual who is free to satisfy all of my needs and desires unfettered by the shackles of any social system. That's, that's in some ways the way some of our present society defines, defies, defines what liberty looks like. Oh, the way they interpret the Founding Fathers version of the pursuit of happiness, which in fact was not their intention. But, so, but we're being freed and brought together. And brought together under his most gracious rule. So we're coming together as a community of people under the authority of the one who died and rose again for us. The ultimate suffering servant who loves us and cares for us with an everlasting love. Which is why, and since that is the goal of history, it's all, it comes down to the implications of how I think about the way I live. If you have done it under the least of these, you have done it to me. That kind of identification only makes sense within this kind of historic trajectory where all people co-equally matter. So, that's the big cosmic vision, you see. And then, with all of that in play, we're not sort of switching gears now into um, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life so that you can be a better American. It's, it's remember the, the author. The author is the first missionary bishop to the Philippines. He prayed that so clothe us in your spirit that we reaching forth our hands in love may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge of you. And see, for Jeremy Brent, going to the Philippines, that meant, in essence, all of the above. Both the personal individual, the community of faith, and the changing of social structures. Hospitals, schools, every place you go in the Philippines, there's a Brent hospital, or something like that, and it all has to do with him. It was the pace he set as a missionary bishop. He understood and this is a part of our heritage as Anglicans and Episcopalians, that we, in fact, 
are meant to be salt and light within the very structures of society. Our job is not to hang out and be an enclave of believers. Sure, we get together. We support one another. We care about one another. We become a family of God that by virtue of its care expresses a witness to the world. But it's always... We used to talk at one point when I was the vicar of a church, we called ourselves a source, S-O-U-R, source church. And what we meant by that was, and this was kind of the way we understood our job description, was that we were inside the church for personal support, for mutual care, for spiritual feeding, and for worship, so that we would have what we needed to be a Christian out there in the world. In other words, the church was our source, but yet it was a source for us to serve effectively out there. Because God had given us a region, which is why you even hear me, if you have, talk about being a bishop. I am not a bishop of 87 congregations in 15 counties. I'm actually the bishop, the bishop of a geographic region, which means I have spiritual responsibility for a region, not merely for the health of those 87 churches, which is why two days after my consecration, I was a part of the demonstration in Sanford around the killing of Terry Von Martin. Um, because that's a part of my region. It wasn't just a question of me calling Holy Cross and saying, how are you all doing with all of this? That certainly had to happen and did. But it was also something larger than that. But you see, what I'm trying to say to you is, that's how we're called to think about our lives. I think that's what Jesus means when he understands, when he says, you're the light of the world. That means wherever I am, I have a calling. I have a vocation. <laughs> I'm supposed to be about the business of my father. Wherever it is that I happen to find myself. And at that level, I don't have off time. You see, the, the temptation, one of my temptations, and it's true for most people in the ordained ministry, is that they're on so much and so cyclically that what happens when they go away from, on vacation is they actually take a vacation from God. And they sort of live like hell for a while. <laughs> and blow off some steam. And, and, and there's nothing dreadfully wrong about that. But the invitation to holiness is an invitation into being available for God to use you actually wherever you are. And no matter where that is. I mean, my wife will tell you, I, I have this thing about praying with people who are on the wait staff of restaurants. We just get into a conversation, something starts to happen. Um, and, and, and Debbie and I were trading some stories in the break about how we kind of connect to really some of the oddest or the most unusual people. And uh, I, I tell you those stories, but I don't want that on this. <laughs> I don't want to talk about people without that permission. But I do kind of meet people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I love that, you see. That's fun for me. And because it has everything to do with how I understand my responsibility. Even when I became the bishop, one of the very first people I went to see was the mayor of Orlando. I, I thought that was my job, quite honestly. And, and so, you see, if I understand my role is... You know, my job is to hide out with Christians and be the faithful believer. And then I'm out in the world, and I'm do it, that's kind of an endurance test, you know. But I'm trying to hold it all together while I'm in the world until I can get back into the church and get more of a punishment, because that's really where my feeling is. There's something actually immature about that. It's not wrong in a kind of temporary sense, but a part of what it means to mature, it seems to me, is to come to understand in a new way or in a deeper way the depth of the river of living water that, is in place, that is, has been placed inside of you so that you get whatever you need so that you can be effective in the world so that you don't have to hide out all the time. There are times when you feel like you need to be in a spiritual hospital. And when that's the case, yeah, you hide, you hide out for a while. You need to recover. That's okay. But those are respites. It's not a lifestyle. It's temporary. So that, for example, I have, a, I have a, just an incredible coterie of intercessors who are praying for us, by the way, and they pray for me. 
And, and I do that all the time. Um, I have a little group. I email them or I talk to them on the phone. And they, they actually sort of live all over the place. Uh, that's one of the beauties of technology is that, in fact, my intercessory circle is, uh, particularly when I first got here, when I actually didn't know very many people. I mean, that's starting to shift and to be more localized. And that's appropriate. But the fact of the matter is, I, 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 I really count. I count on those prayers. Because if my job is to be instant in season or out of season, remember that's one of the admonitions. A part of that means is, is that even if I'm feeling really lousy, or if I'm feeling really afraid, or if I'm feeling particularly condemned about a sin pattern with which I am wrestling, or I'm struggling with some human relationships that aren't working the way that I wanted to, and an opportunity to serve comes my way, God being my helper, I still want to find a way to be able to step in. Now, some of that is my own sinful drivenness. There is a rhythm, and there is a pace that is appropriate. And a part of my sin nature is not so much to commit evil, although that is also a temptation, as much as it is to be driven to exhaustion in the doing of the good. Mm -hmm. That can be just as wicked as the call to actually commit overt evil acts. And so that's a part of where I need to pay attention. But there is this trajectory, you see. Who am I? I'm a part of what God is doing in the earth. That's a part of who I am as a Christian. That's why I'm called by Jesus himself as salt, light, and a part of something that's called a city set on a hill. Which means I'm to be available to him in all of the planet earth that he places me because all people co-equally matter in the sight of God. Unlike my upbringing, there are not lessers and greaters. But each one is deeply and profoundly and personally important to God. Actually, whether I think so or not. In fact, sometimes it's like, I don't want to do that. And God says, come on, do it anyway. And that's godly, you see. That's not wrong, that's godly. And so God intentionally... And, mixes me up with people who are very not like me. And he does it not just because I'm a servant to them, but he also does it for my own sanctification. Because being with people not like me gives me the eyes to challenge the distinction between heritage and inheritance. You mix it up with Christians who are in a very different cultural place than you or in a very different theological grid from you. A part of what it's meant to do is cause you to go back and challenge your assumptions. That's heritage. Those assumptions are heritage. What I really think about that, or is that actually the most godly way to approach something? It, it's about this commitment. I'm, all, I'm always, great word, I'm always being beckoned somewhere whether it has to do with how I'm thinking, whether it has to do with my assumptions, it, whether it has to do with how I see myself, whether it has to do with how I see God. If the trajectory, again according to the scriptures, is from wisdom to wisdom and glory to glory, if I'm learning how to be a man and put away childish things, I'm always at one level in transition. Always. I'm not called, in other words, to a settled life even if I live in the same address for the next 30 or 40 years. So there is no place in my life, quite honestly, except for my, my deep and profound gratitude to Jesus that is settled. I'm always wrestling, for example, with issues of stewardship and money. How much is too much? Really, how much is too much? How much should I be giving away? Um, because I understand when I look, especially at, if you, did you hear the Sermon on the Mount on Ash Wednesday? Woo! It's terrifying. Um, but it's terrifying because I'm afraid of that loss. Oh, what if I begin to give away at a level that I'm not now and then I don't have enough money to pay the bills? 
Or what if I'm called to give away money and what winds up happening is that I get really ill and I don't have enough money to be able to take care of what my insurance doesn't cover? Or are you, I mean, you can create the list. All of us can. So that's my, that's my tight fist. That's my desire to be in control. That's my desire to make sure I understand what's going on and I know how to act appropriately. That's my realism, which is it's, can be its own item. And so I'm, I'm always being called to open my hand in a different way, or in a deeper way. This is, this is process. This is not accomplishment. There's always the beckoning. But it is the beckoning that both changes me and allows me new freedoms to be able to give and to serve the people that God sends my way. And, and I want to keep up with that. Because the needs are enormous. You know, the more you dive in, the bigger the needs are. And you say, God, I need more prayer power than this. Mm -hmm. I, I ain't got it yet. Or, God, this is a conundrum, and I don't know how to stand, understand it at all. And sure, it's powerful to say, I don't get it either, but I'm willing to walk you through it. And that's important, because that's the God with us position. We don't bail on people just because we don't understand what they're going through. But, Lord, I really would like some wisdom here. Can you help me out? How lot new places in me to receive what it is that you're trying to teach me? I still don't yet know how to reach forth my hands in love to bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love. Hear those of you. It happens some. Sometimes I can see what you're doing, this trajectory that's literally changing the earth. Other time, all I think about is war and hatred and violence and terror and I don't see your hand in that at all. Isn't that all true for us, you see? So I'm always being changed. I'm always being changed. And the call from God is to Lord, help me learn how to say yes. To see what you're doing and to say yes to it. Even if it's very different from what it is that I have known in the past. Does that make sense as a way to think about things? Um, because I, I really do believe with all my heart that that's what the scripture teaches. And what holds it all together, it seems to me, is back in John 17. See, there's a reason that if you look at all of this, God loves us as we are. Nothing we do changes the way God's love for me. We really have to stop holding on to the shame. Grace is always there. I mean, the words that actually meant something to a lot of the people in the room were in fact words of assurance. And I need to imbibe that in deep and profound ways. Because the more I know and in every way that that word know means, the more I know that I am walking in the companionship of God's presence, the more I am free to take some risks. Because God is trustable. And I know that. And so I'm going to step out. <laughs> and, and the wonder of it is, is that you're not aware of it. You, you don't know that you're being adventurous and kind of daring. Occasionally you do. You kind of go, I don't know. But sometimes people notice it before you do. You mean you did that? Really? I, when I was in Northern Uganda, we were in a war zone where the LRA, I don't know whether you've heard of the LRA, child soldiers, all that sort of stuff, huge Sudanese refugees, huge population, pouring in Northern Uganda. And we had connected with the Anglican clergy who were up there because the strategy was is that if we could support them in some ways, they wouldn't abandon their flocks. And they became the trusted people so that when Tier Fund and some of the international agencies came in with real financial aid, not anything we could provide, um, they were the trusted coordinators. Tell me what's really going on in this community. What, what's the need? And so the Red Cross, all those people, they were going to the clergy because they were the leaders. So we felt like, what could we do in that situation? We could support the clergy. But that meant we had to travel around and be with them. 
So we're in a jeep, literally, with an, ar with an army officer on the back of the jeep with a, a machine gun, sort of making our way through the back. And there was a fr one of the team, I didn't do this a lot, one of the team that went with me, I went with three other men, was a uh, former Green Beret. Now, he, because of his combat training, was highly sensitive to being in positions of danger. I'm not. <laughs> Remember, I grew up in, in the suburbs. <laughs> and, um, and so the bishop, McLeod Ochoa, when the jeep stopped and we were walking through the bush into a clearing where there was going to be this gathering of Christians. And so he hopped off the bus, and, I mean the jeep, and I was literally right behind him. Well, my friend, the Green Bray, was like, what's on the other side of that bush? This feels like an ambush to me. In fact, in Vietnam, it was an ambush. Mm -hmm. So he's holding back, kind of watching. I'm just kind of blindly walking right there in front of the bishop, beside, behind the bishop, and we make our way in. And he comes up to me afterwards and he said, you just walked in there like you were just taking a walk in the park. I said, I guess I didn't know any differently, did I? <laughs> but you know, part of that was, was that I knew that I was there by divine appointment. I'm not talking about being foolish or foolhardy. But it's, in fact, a, a kind of a place of trust. That's what we're being invited into. The more I know that companionship, the more my hands are being opened, the more I have something to be able to give, the more I actually have the freedom to take the hands of Jesus and go where it is that he is taking me. Because he is taking us places. Places that we have not known. I was, in fact, culturally entirely unprepared to go in some of the places where I went. Right? And where I'm sure going to be going in the future. But I had the sense that it's still the right thing to do. The only safety net I've made is, is that my wife and I have to agree. We have to know, both of us, that God is calling me, or us, because sometimes it's at us, to go to some of these places in other parts of the U.S. or the world. And so long as she says it's okay and says, I hear God in this, then she's at peace while I'm gone, and I can go and do these things, because she's, for her, no. She doesn't travel in places like that at all, which is fine. So the question becomes, in a way, if you're saying yes to asking Jesus to open your hands, this is really the takeaway. You're actually saying yes to mission. You can't ask Jesus to open your hands without saying yes to mission. To say it negatively. There is no openness without mission. And he decides what it is. It's his call. It's life on his terms, not yours. No matter what your heritage has taught you. If anyone would come after me, you know the verse, mm -hmm. let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, for he who would save his life, because that's what this is, will lose it. But he who is willing to lose his life, open his hands, for my sake, not foolhardily, but for my sake, <coughs> will find it. There are things I will not be able to find about who I am and who God is until I'm willing to be a part of that kind of giving flow. You, you see, it's not a question of, because since we are always under construction, that's very well said that because we are always under construction, there's not a point where, okay, I, I, I think I'm accomplished enough to be able to do this. That's not how this works. I mean, that's like asking a three-year-old to be able to analyze the aerodynamic mechanics of a tricycle before you actually put the kid on the tricycle. That's not how it works. You put them on, and you're there holding the handlebars, and they're finally getting the idea that there is some coordination between how fast it goes and what you do with your hands on the pedal, your hands on the pedals, and, and eventually, bang, they're off. You you can't prepare them on the front end for that. 
or riding a bike, a two-wheeler, or you fill in the blank in terms of what that might be. I think that's what mission is. It's not a question of analysis, preparedness, and then going, as much as it is asking Jesus to teach you how to go. And as you are learning to go, he opens the doors for you into larger and larger vistas. I don't mean you're going to leave here and you're going to fly to Uganda, or that God is going to call you to serve you know, among the people of Pakistan, or anything of the sort. I'm not, I'm not speaking naively. Instead, although he might later, if you're learning how to say yes now, but what I am saying is, is that there is a vista. There is something for which he has prepared you. There is a playing field into which you are being invited. And that that act of stepping out and saying yes is a part of God's plan, not only to make a difference in others, but actually to change you into his likeness. And there are changes, this is important, there are changes that God wants to work in you that you long for that will never happen in the prayer closet. But they will happen on the mission field. We have this idea that I just need to pray and get ready and eventually God will do the work and then I'll be ready and then I'll go. I don't see it in the Bible. I really don't. Story about my wife. Larley and I have been involved in healing ministry for a while. But you need to know that our batting average was not very good. Still not all that great, by the way. I'm utterly convinced that the healing ministry by its very nature is episodic, not a formula. Um, but we went to the Philippines. We were part of a team. And uh, the, play, the way this was set up was an Episcopal priest had organized a group of people almost all of whom were dentists from the U.S. and from the Philippines who were in dental school, that his ministry was underwriting the support of these people to go to dental school. And we would pull up into a village of Barrio, and the dental clinic would be open all day long. Most of what we did, quite honestly, not we, I didn't. Most of what they did was pull teeth, just because of the terrible nutrition that there was. And then at night, we would host a meeting where there would be music and biblical teaching and opportunities for prayer. And we would go from barrio to barrio to barrio, staying in all kinds of places. And, uh, and the agreement that Marley and I had is that we would be a team together and that if a woman uh, wanted prayer, then she would take the lead and she would do the praying and I would literally stand behind the woman and she would be right there to pray. And if it was a man, it would be just the opposite. And that's how we work. And it worked actually really very well. Well, you need to know, if you want to use language about did we have faith for this, um, in terms of a kind of qualitative level, the answer is no. <laughs> we were willing to step out. That was, that was our level. Well, let's see what happens. But were we old hands at this? And uh, so, I'll never forget. One night, we were there, and a woman came up, and she had a goiter the size of a tennis ball on her, which again is a malnutrition symptom. And she, she stood up, and immediately we kind of went into place. She was in front, and I was behind. And she looked at Laura Lee, couldn't speak English, and she went, just like that. And Laura Lee looked at me like, what am I going to do? So she put her hands on her, her neck, just like that. I put my hands on the woman's shoulder. We began to pray. No exaggeration. The goiter disappeared under Laura Lee's fingertips. <laughs> Laura Lee was so shocked. <laughs> then Laura Lee was going, <laughs> and like, where'd it go? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the look the woman gave her was hysterical. It was like, you dummy. <laughs> That's what I came for. <laughs> and there were other stories very, very similar to that. Um, and it, it changed us. It changed us. So that when I was in New York not long ago, 
We had a very active Alpha program where people were coming to faith in Christ, including this very shy, retiring Chinese man who was actually from Panama, only in New York. So his name was Paco, even though he was Chinese. And Paco had just come to faith, brand new Christian. And it showed up at our Sunday evening service. Paco, shy, Asian type, was standing off by himself at the coffee area after it was all over. And I'm walking around and saying hi to people. So I, I noticed that Paco's by himself, so I want to go over and say hi. So I go over to Paco and I said, how are you doing? In a very uncharacteristic way, he goes, I can hear! Just like that. <laughs> I said, tell me what happened. Well, the story is, is that, and you can see from the scars, he had terrible cancer all mm. up through here. Mm. And it had actually destroyed the hearing of his right ear. Mm. And the doctor said to him, we, this will never come back. The only thing that we can do, and some of you I know have heard of the surgery, they do it at Johns Hopkins and others, where they put something inside where your brain thinks you're hearing through your both ears, but it's actually just through your good ear. So it helps you with your ability to be able to sort of deal with people. And you could tell because he actually talked in that kind of muffled, fumbling way that people who can't hear well talk. I mean, all of the symptoms were there. And um, then he said, right in the middle of the service, nobody laid hands on him or anything. We're up there, we're doing the service. I mean, you know, we're just going through the liturgy. His ear just opened up. Okay. And, um, and I said, first of all, my first response was, Paco, that's phenomenal. And I said, Paco, would you do th two things for me? Oh, yeah. You know, you can do anything. He said, go to a doctor. And secondly, would you share your story next Sunday night? And he did. He did both of those. And he shared his story on Sunday. And, and it, was, it was literally the appropriate role in the New Testament that signs, these are considered signs, mm -hmm. that signs were made to effect, which was God is with you. That's what this is about. Um, and I particularly believe in the kind of hostile, uh, relatively anti-Christian environment that we live in. There are only three things that are going to win the world. One does have to do with the displays of the miraculous, things happening for which there is no other explanation. The second is radical sacrifice and mercy, where people see both by relationships as well as people's giving out in the world that they are not like people I've known before. And then once the, that openness begins to happen, then real clarity about proclamation, a clear understanding of the gospel, how it relates and does it relate to culture and an ability that you can talk winsomely without, you know, being, you know, abrasive, offensive. And, and I've seen it happen. In fact, a friend of mine used to head up a Christian organization that ministered to students at the University of Paris, a very hostile, anti-Christian environment. And, uh, and so he had no idea how I began to live out Jeremy Brent's prayer, you know, bring those who do not know you to the knowledge of you. Well, they were engaged, he began to get the Christians, small enough, to be engaged in hugely sacrificial acts of kindness and hospitality to the neediest of the city of Paris. And they began to invite their friends to come and help do that with them. And what that began to do was prompt the conversations. You know, most of my friends who are in law school at the Sorbonne don't give a you-know-what about the people on the streets. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing what you do? And that created the opportunity for a conversation about God who says that everybody matters. Everybody matters. So how can you not? So what I want to say to you is we close this section is that we're invited into something that's a lot bigger than ourselves. Uh, do not make the mistake of say, thinking that what the goal of what you're about is dealing with my own personal need for healing. Oh, your God is too small. It is too light a thing, as it says in the book of Isaiah. But instead, understand that what God is after is that he is in fact wanting to shape you inform you and equip you 
so that you can be about what it is that he is doing in the world. A purpose that is far larger than your own individual restoration. As important as that is. Believe me, if all you want is your own restoration, there are plenty of ways that that can happen uh, that don't even have to have the name of Jesus on it. You can feel better about yourself in a lot of venues. But this is something different. And the difference has to do with being equipped for ministry, being shaped by Jesus for the express purpose that you are willing to find new ways and are open to new ways to being servants in the world. That repentance, that healing, restoration, revelation are always God beckoning us further into his mission. <coughs> whose will it is to restore all things in heaven and earth. That's the breadth of what we're invited into. Anything other than that is just Western pietistic individualism. And it does not describe the vision of the Bible. You might be able to get away with it if you take about a third of the New Testament out. But that's what it would take to do it. Remember, that's what Thomas Jefferson did. He did he, he didn't really like all the miracle stuff, so he just yeah. cut all that out of the Bible. Yeah. You can go see it you know, in Charlottesville. No, 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 let's not be that kind of Christian. But understand that it's this big. It's bigger than anything we can even begin to enter into. And that's on purpose. So that we are broken, both by ourselves as well as by the breadth of the vision. And out of that, be able to say, oh, God. I don't know how, but here I am, Sydney. And that as we enter in, we discover new places of healing in us, even as we're pouring out our hearts on the people that God sends our way. That's, that's really the vision. That's the adventure. God's love, all that he's done for us in Jesus, is the assurance, the adventure, of being, is being his channel. In wherever way he might take us. I think we're done. It's a little after 12. I ran over. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do very, the very brief office in the New Day office in the Philo. And then you're going to go to lunch. And then you'll come back here for you, Chris. Uh, if you need to, why don't we take a little bit of extra time? Why don't we say around 1.15 or so to come back? So if you need to pack up your room and get some things in the car, you're free 